pulling in later than usual, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. And Tom, we are live right now. Is that correct? We are live. Well, if you're online, thank you for joining us as well. We are here at Tower View Baptist Church. So let me just get arranged here and we'll be good to go. Well, it is a unique day, and I want to read something to you that's not my own, but it could have been written by my own hand because uh, it expresses so much of my thoughts. Uh, I want to just say a word about COVID for a second. I want to uh, take a moment to uh, congratulate one of our people, then we'll pray and we'll get on with our sermon just so you know. We we're going to do this at the very first, but I didn't want to leave Lane out in the rain handing out bulletins to people and drive in church, so we, so uh, thank you for, for bearing with us. Uh, Although we probably should, because that's a good internship experience, is to stand in the rain and hand out bulletins. But uh, my good pastor friend, Tim Fritzen, from Liberty Christian Fellowship in Liberty, wrote this. Some of you have seen this on Facebook I shared, but I think it is worthwhile. I just want to read it to you, and I want to share some things about how it affects us here. He said, I cried actual tears this morning on Friday, tears of relief, tears of fatigue, and tears of release. The last 15 months or so have been the leadership grind. Navigating the shifting and ever-evolving COVID-19 landscape has been challenging for anyone who has been in leadership or making decisions of any kind in any sector of American society, and the church is no different. Our leadership team has opted to take a position that we felt to sought to honor the guidance of our local city, be compassionate to the vulnerable among our congregation, and consider of our community as a whole. How did we do that? We tried to balance the desire to continue to minister to our people while the pandemic was serious. We scaled back programming. We canceled stuff. We got creative. We shifted programming. We limited capacities. We spaced people out. We required masks. And it wasn't universally popular. Some thought we moved too quickly. People left. Some thought we were too rigid. People left. Some thought we were frustrated that we required masks from the beginning, left, then posted pictures on social media in the future wearing masks at their new church. Those made me very sad. Some were grateful and encouraging. They were like fresh water to my soul in what felt like a desert wasteland of leadership loneliness. Did we do everything right? Probably not. Was every decision perfect? Heavens no. If I had to do it all over again, would we handle some aspects differently? Let's pray we don't. I couldn't be more proud of our team who led, and he, he mentions his church, and I'll end it right there. You could have stole the words right out of my mouth. Pastor Tim and I are very close. We're both marathon runners. We're both young. We're both all those things. Grew up in this area, blah, blah, blah. But friends, that has been our, our last 15 months here. We have tried to navigate these waters very carefully. So as we enter this new phase, for some of you outside, that's going to be a bigger step of faith perhaps than it has been in months. We want to encourage you to come inside. On August 1st, we are going to be cutting the cord temporarily for the, uh, for the drive-in church. Why? Because we feel like we need to be together. If you have concerns about that, you need to talk to us. Don't talk to each other, gossipy, talk to us, because we're the leaders. We want to be back together. We know there are health concerns. We know there are legitimate concerns. If you have those, that's okay. Talk to us. But we're a family, and families talk, families disagree, but we get together well, don't we? And I want to thank our staff, I want to thank our deacons, I want to thank our leadership team for getting us through this last 15 months, and for you guys. I know for some, it is too soon. How could they have turned on a dime on Friday and done the mass thing? Look, this is why as a leadership team, we have followed the local authorities. We are doing nothing more, nothing less than what has been required by us by law, by, by what we should be doing. So if you have concerns, go to the CDC uh, and, and, and do that. But our biggest concern here is that we worship Christ. That's it. And that is going to look different, has looked different, but we want to do it together. So if you're outside, it's okay. You're not less of a Christian than people are inside or inside out. We encourage you to come inside. But we also want you to know that there is coming a day where that outside thing is going to go away. It's not a bad thing. Guys, it was needed, wasn't it? We absolutely needed to do drive-in church. But we're in a new chapter. And if things change over the summer and cases spike again and we have to shift, we're going to shift. But I want you to know our priority is to get people inside. Does that make sense? Is it just about being inside? No, it's not just about being inside. But at some point, we have to return to normality, whatever that is. And so I hope that makes sense. I know we're in the middle of a service. I was going to do this at the front. Thank you for your patience. But one good thing that has come out of this, Lane, come on up. Lane's going to be with us, I think, for a little while longer at least. Uh, but Lane, where did I put your gift? Uh, Lane Paul, la let me let me be uh, use his official name because he's from Arkansas. It's Lane Ryan Paul. It's all four letters. Lane Ryan Paul. 
has been interning with us since last September. What a year to intern at a church. Uh, of all years, and uh, he's not officially done with his internship, but we wanted to take today and give him something he has talked about so much. Can I just spoil what it is? I think you already, I think you already know. Uh, if you've not been to the Midwestern Baptist Seminary coffee shop, Lane is their best customer. <laughs> so we got Lane some ground up uh, Tomlinson blend, which is after an old professor, and Midwestern Baptist blend, so he can go home and make his own coffee and act all cool seminary guy like. Lane, we appreciate you, we love you, and uh, we're so grateful you're with us. Can I give him a side hug? Is that appropriate? All right, here we go. Would you give me a round of applause? And uh, you go for it, man. Lane has stuck with us back in Arkansas. They've been open for a long time. He's had to put on uh, his... Uh, uh, patient breaks because he's had to work with us here in Kansas City, but he's always come with a seriousness for the gospel. He's come with uh, a pastoral uh, eye of things. He's young. He's got a lot to learn, as we all do, but I want you to know that we're so grateful he's with us, and we're so grateful that he is among us, and uh, Lord willing, for many, wink, wink, uh, for many more years until he graduates, but uh, that's it. God may call him to other places as God leads as he does, but guys, we have a lot to be thankful for. I just want to say thank you again for your patience through this COVID time. I know I've taken seven minutes, and we haven't even started the sermon, amen? But I, you need to hear this, that we love you. We know we have not done things right all the time. We know that some, look, thank you for being patient. That's all we can say. Our goal is Christ. It has looked different. It will continue to look different perhaps in the coming months, but that's what our focus is, okay? We love you all so much. Let's pray together, and we're going to get into our text. And uh, I hear the rain coming down outside, and my phone just told me there's lots of rain coming down outside. So uh, it is what it is. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you so much. Father, there's a lot to be thankful for. Lord, we thank you that in our church we have had COVID cases, serious ones, Father, some that have been very close to the end, uh, if we're honest. Even one recently in our church that has overcome COVID is now in rehab. Father, our folks here know their names, but Lord, we're grateful no one has passed away. We know it's a serious thing. We take that seriously. But Lord, through every step of this, you have been what you've always said you have been. You have been faithful. And Lord, whether we lost some or we didn't, you have still been good. And we thank you for that. Be with our church in these coming days. Be with all churches in these coming days. Father, where people are at different stages of where they're comfortable and at. But Father, I pray our focus as in every church, and we pray for our sister church in Ebo Hills as well for this that's on our bulletin today. We pray that Christ would be exalted. That's what we're about. Father, there are necessary and hard conversations ahead for how we implement things and get back to normal. But Father, it's an exciting thing that we can get back to classes in our children's center here locally and all these things. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Brother Lane as he's been such a light to us, a blessing. And we joke with him about his Arkansas and all that stuff. But Lord, at the end of the day, we love him. We know he's done great work here. He's going to continue to do great work here. Father, and whatever church you would call him to during seminary, after seminary, is going to be abundantly blessed. So thank you. Father, as we enter your word now, we give it all to you as we continue on where we left off last week. Thank you for your grace. We pray all this today in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Well, we do invite your attention then to 1 Thessalonians and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up in verse 5, uh, and I promise you my goal is to get done this week. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, and you're there. We are in our sixth part, I believe, of the series about being countercultural. And if you're inside, we're just going to read our scripture because we're, uh, for sake of time, if you're able to stand this morning, if you're inside, would you stand with us as we read our scripture? If you're at home or in your cars, you feel free to join us how you can. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 5, go down to verse 13. And our title today is Suffering in Community. Suffering in Community what Paul says. He says, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I learned, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, that's Satan, and you and our labor would be in vain. But now, verse 6, that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly to see us. We long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, in all our stress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you're standing fast in the Lord. For verse 9, what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? As we pray earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. Time out right there. I did not plan it this way that the weekend we'd come back would be face to face, but 
Here we are. We may see you face to face, verse 10, and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our Lord God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that we establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Note, as we said a few uh, weeks ago, every chapter in, the end of every verse of First Thessalonians talks about the return of the Lord. It's an interesting thing. Let's pray together. We're going to get in our text and we're, gonna, we're just going to dig in. Let's, let's pray together again. Father, thank you so much for those online, for those in their cars, for those inside on this very stormy, rainy morning here, Father. Thank you that the power's on. Thank you that it's working. Thank you, Lord, that we have most of all your word. Father, energize us through your word this morning on a day where it's kind of one of those nappy, sleep in, kind of fall asleep days. Lord, may your word just speak to our lives. By your spirit, not my words, but all by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. All right, guys, well, you may be seated, and today's big idea, and I'm not doing a flowery introduction again for sake of time, but I want you to know our big idea today is that as Christians, we are called to be gospel-centered people who grow in biblical community and who serve together on mission to advance Jesus' gospel in and through suffering. That's a mouthful. Well, the first thing I want you to see, last week we noted that, 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 that the work of the gospel in, a, in the midst of a suffering community, we shared two things last week. It must be spread abroad and not just in one place, and that it places believers in harm's way. If you look back at verse 3 and 4, you remember what Paul said. He told us that, he told the Thessalonians that you knew this day was coming. It's almost like when your parents tell you that one day you're going to have to pay taxes or your own health insurance, you knew this day was coming. You knew this was, we told you beforehand. But the constant work of the gospel requires that we meet together, that as we suffer, that we get closer to each other. And so we pick it up there in verse 5. This work of the gospel is another point to this is this. The third point is this, is that as we do the work of the gospel together, suffering in community, it is under constant bombardment by the enemy. Constant bombardment by the enemy. Well, who's the enemy? Is it uh, a, a political party? Is it another nation? Who is it? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly who it is. It is Satan himself, doesn't it? It says, for this reason I wrote to you when I could bear it no longer. Can you feel Paul's pain there? He, he, he wanted to embrace the God-ordained strength in numbers. And he knew that Satan was playing with his head, was trying to tempt him away. But he knew that separation and individualism is not Christianity. That's American Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. He was torn. But he was even more torn because he thought somehow the tempter had really tempted them away. When the work of the gospel goes forth, Satan is always right there in the midst, isn't he? He's always right there. When good things are going in your life, Satan is always trying there to mess it up. And as Lane read in the, in the scripture reading this morning, we know that God has him on a leash, doesn't he? Satan does not run amok. Satan is not the yin to the Lord's yang, so to speak, if you want to put it in very secular language. Satan is very real, and we must remember that. He is very, very real. So much, in fact, you look at the end of verse uh, 5, Paul is worried that his labor might be in vain. Parents, sometimes you feel this way with your kids, don't you? Especially those with grown kids, that all that work you put into those kids may be in vain. It might have been fruitless. But Paul reminds us here that Satan is very, very real. Well, friends, how do we know? I mean, uh, do you, I mean, if you really ask people, is there really a devil running around? I mean, doesn't that just sound so like 17th century? But if you're a Christian, you know this to be true. I mean, don't you? Don't you know that Satan is real? Don't you feel his presence? And no, I'm not talking about some weird like a Ouija board thing or some goofy Hollywood stuff. But the Bible says that it's, he's a real being. That in Genesis 3, however that worked, Satan was historical. He was there. In Job chapter 1, he was there. In Isaiah chapter 14, he was there. Uh, Jesus himself was either hallucinating or he was something was going on. But at his temptation, who was there? Satan was there. And this is what it's always called. He's called a, he's, the devil's works are called a scheme, Ephesians 6, 11. He has a will, 2 Timothy 2, 26. He prowls around, 1 Peter 5, 8, and Jesus himself, again, dialogues with him. So yes, there is a real devil. And as we seek to come together as a community here at Tower View, you better believe Satan is going to be at work. And friends, we have to be aware of his schemes. 
For some right now, that could be as simple as, I don't agree with this law change, or I do agree with this law change. I'm going to hold my pride up here about this change. Be careful. Don't let your victory this last Friday or, or lack of victory this last Friday with local laws changing be a temptation point for you to be sinful in how you handle yourself with other brothers and sisters. That'll kill community. That'll kill gospel work. And it'll kill the advancement of the kingdom. But he is very real. For as real as Satan is, though, I want you to know Christ is realer still. He's always more real. Satan has the party, but Jesus has the ultimate party going on because he is the resurrected life. Let me clear this up too. Sometimes you see uh, pictures of Satan and God wrestling like arms like this. No, that's Hollywood. God has always won the victory. He always has won the victory. Romans 16 19 says, that's a camp song, did you know that? <laughs> that someday God will soon stomp Satan underneath his feet. He will. And he has done that mostly at the cross. Satan still fights like a dying thing. But as Martin Luther said, he's the Lord's devil. He's the Lord's devil. So we need to be careful. The enemy's always there. Fourth thing we need to, verses 6 and 7, the work of the gospel brings encouragement to those who labor. Look back at verse 6. He says, but now Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, in all our destruction and affliction, we've been comforted through your faith. Friends, this, this is what it's all about. Why, as Christians, do we have different relationships when we come together? Because we have a different Lord. We have a different perspective, don't we? The good news of your faith. He wanted to hear how they were doing spiritually. Now, when is the last time you asked someone in this church, how you doing spiritually? That sounds kind of funky, doesn't it? It sounds kind of weird, like spiritually. Well, not physically, but spiritually. Try that and see how it goes. You'd be amazed at what people will say. Ask someone how they have grown or not grown in the pandemic this last year and a half and still going on. You'll be amazed at what God has done in people's lives. You all have shared what God has done in your life. Some of you have just... Wow, you've gone from zero to 100 with the Lord close because you've had more time on your hands and it's been directed time with the Word, the Lord, with, with other people. But that is what it's all about. We want to see people grow in Christ. And he says that, that you would have a mature love. You notice that word love there? He wants them to have a love. He wants them to have a, the type of love that is mature in how they handle themselves. And he says there's also a genuine empathy. There's, he's remembering kindly. He's remembering their faith, but he still longs to see them. Christian, if there's nothing else that gets your go, let it be this, is that this is one of the most important things you can do in your life is to be around other Christians. Because the more you're around other Christians, the more you grow and desire and want to be closer to the Lord because, man, I want to be close to the Lord like that person is. And Paul knew that as he looked out, he knew in all their distresses, in all their things, he was comforted about their faith. You want to know what makes us pastors happy? Is when you're doing well spiritually. We want you well physically, we do, but we want to see you well spiritually. And Christian, as we grow together in this gospel community, we need to remember that the greatest conversations we can have are not about the royals, I love the royals, not about the Chiefs, if they're going to go back to this. I think the Chiefs are going to be the Buffalo Bills in the 1990s. We're going to go to the Super Bowl every year, not win, but no, I'm sorry. I'll save that for another sermon. But you know, it's, those are fun things to talk about. But I would encourage us, as Paul did, that as he labored among them, as he was among each other, it wasn't sports or weather or even kids and family. That's great. It was, how are you doing spiritually? And he longed to see how they were doing. Do you long to see how others are doing? Because we, the more you rejoice with how their, God is working in their lives, the more you'll see God work in yours. Verse 8, he goes on. He says, not only must we celebrate that, but also verses 8 and 9, the work of the gospel is the only work that is worthwhile. And I'll qualify that. Look back at verse 8. He says, hearing about this, he says, for now we live if you're standing fast in the Lord. What gave Paul encouragement? It's knowing that people were growing in Christ. It wasn't attendance. It wasn't budget. It wasn't buildings. It wasn't, uh, you know, my kid had this great soccer thing or, the, you know, we achieved over here, did this. Those are fine. It was that they were standing fast in the Lord. This is going to sound crazy, 
But if your health were to tank, but you were strong spiritually, of course we're going to pray for you. Of course we're going to pray in the hospital for you. But we're praying mostly for you spiritually in the hospital, that God would use that time in your life to grow you closer to him. Paul says here, we live if you're standing fast in the Lord. Friends, this church only grows to the fact that we measure success not by butts and seats, but by the building of the faith in Christ. Amen? Now, that sounds funny. Well, don't you need people to hear? Yeah, we do. But friends, you need to remember that gospel joy and gospel faithfulness is the only true success that comes. When you see wherever you work, the only work that matters is the gospel work. When you see your workplace as a mission field, when you see your home, whether you have grandkids or kids or you're a widow or widow, whatever it is, and you see your home as a mission field, and you see wherever you are as a mission field, your neighborhood, then you know that the only thing that really matters at the end of the day is whether people are standing fast in the Lord. That's it. You say, well, I've got to work a job. Well, yes, you do. I've got to take care of my family. That's great. But have you considered how the Lord is working through that? We live, he says, if you're standing fast in the Lord. Friends, we will only grow as much as a church and community as we see that every place we step is a place where God has put us to be an ambassador, a representative, and a mouthpiece for him to declare his glories. Why was he, why was he celebrating this? Well, he tells you in verse 9. Look at verse 9. He says, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy we feel for your sake. Paul says this, I rejoice in this that I see you growing in the Lord. You're taking your faith seriously. You desire that all people would come to know Christ. That's how I rejoice in you. Friends, we have a lot to celebrate here at Tower View, don't we? A lot. Do you realize that next year, some of you old-timers of the church, Mercy, I was thinking about this. You were talking about this the other day at the funeral. 60 years next year at Tower View Baptist Church. Isn't that nuts? 60 years. Six zero years. We have a lot to celebrate of 60 years. We are getting our children's center revamped. We are seeing uh, people growing in the Lord. Our offerings are out of this world. Jeff Jones sleeps at night. Thank you for letting Jeff Jones sleep every night and Karen and, and Ann and the rest of the finance team. But more so, we're seeing the gospel go out in ways we never have. But why do we praise God? We praise God in the same way Paul does, because we see that God is working in your lives. And next year, as we celebrate our 60th anniversary, we're going to recount some of those things, how God has worked. Because the more we see that he's at work in even the most mundane things, the more we will grow in him. But friends, it is only the result of this. He ends the verse 9 this way. He says, all the joy we feel for your sake, all the joy. Does coming to church seem more like a drudge, or does it really get you fired up for Jesus? That's really the question he's asking here. Because when Paul looked at his community, he was like that guy at the Chiefs game. He, I don't even know which, how did I get on the Chiefs again? <laughs> but the guy, it's all the red here, I think, is what it is. The guy at the Chiefs game that paints his chest, and he's got a big belly, and he just, Rawr! you know, he's that guy in the stands. Man, how much more should we feel like that at church? Because we're together. And when we're together, we rejoice even in the hard times that come our way because it's hard sometimes, isn't it? This last year has been hard. It still is hard. Some of you have lost your job. Some of you have lost family. Some of you have lost connections with people. But together, despite those hardships, we rejoice together because we know that you're going through similar things. And we have a Lord that understands that and can sympathize with our weaknesses. He goes on in verse 10, this gospel work. And he says, not only is it hard, but it's also, look at verse 10, this work of the gospel requires the support and interaction of other believers. The gospel work requires the support and interaction of other believers. And I'll put these online or through our email stuff later. Uh, We haven't quite got to PowerPoint yet. We're back in the 1990s here, so we'll get back there someday. But he says in verse 10, as we pray most earnestly day and night that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your face, in your faith, excuse me. Look, the cornerstone of Christian interaction, the cornerstone of community, the cornerstone of us coming together is that we pray for one another. That's why, that's it. The two most important things you can have in your church are your Bible and your membership directory. You all can, you all can uh, put some gospel pressure on our f- photographer Tom and Diana and some others. We need a new directory to get some new faces. But you have your prayer calendars. We send it out if you're on Facebook. It goes out at 9 a.m. every day. Thank you, Judy. Are you praying for other people in this church? 
Are you really praying? He says, we pray earnestly for you. You know, it's sad that sometimes we pray, but we really don't know the people we pray for. I would encourage you, if that's where you're at, and, I, and it's hard because we don't, haven't interacted as much, but if you haven't a face with a name, or if you don't know someone so well, would you, if you're praying for that list, just circle their name. Contact the office. We'll get you some contact info, and you can text them, you can call them, you can write them. Say, hey, I'm praying for you. Is there anything specific that I can pray for you? That kind of thing changes churches. Because when Paul said, I'm praying for you, he knew it was necessary. But also more than prayer, notice what he says, that we may see you, that we may see you. I'm looking at the camera again. Online church is great. It has its place for those who are unable to physically come. But if you're able to get here, if you're online, please join us in person. Why? That we may see you face to face. A gospel community grows when people interact with each other. I love technology. If I crack you, I love to. I have a phone right up here. I've got a watch right here. I've got this cool earpiece up here. I love technology, don't you? It's great. It helps us. It works when it works. Nelson, Pastor Nelson says. But when we are in community together, we have to be face-to-face. -face. Look, the Lord knows there were times where Zoom and these things work, but friends, we've got to see each other face-to-face. -face. That's never going to change. And he says, that is the goal, the cornerstone of interaction, is personal investment. Why? He tells you at the end of verse 10, that, the, that, 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 that may we may supply what's lacking in your faith. So often when we come to church, we don't come realizing that sometimes we are going to be encouraging someone else or God's going to speak through someone else to encourage us with the word from the Lord. And we need it. Church, you need to pray for each other. You need to make sure you're interacting with each other, especially face to face. And you need to make sure that you know how to serve other Christians in the midst of times like these. Look, the last thing we need today is lonely people practicing loneliness together. Amen. Among people who from the beginning of time have been broken by pride, we need to know that individualism is not the answer. We have to be together. The church is a body, and we need it. We need community. We need the sustenance that it provides. And that's why we are going to continue to say, get together, get together, get together. And for a lot of us, that's a big duh we have to practice it. Because friends, there are churches now that are not and are not going to. And we need to encourage each other as long as the day is here. We are going to exemplify the need for community as much as possible. It doesn't just mean putting a new program in. It doesn't just mean uh, rearranging relationships. What it means is, is that wherever we go, whatever we do, we want to make sure that community is the focus together. Community is the focus. Are you praying for that here at our church? Please make that a matter of prayer. I don't have all the answers to that. I'll admit that's one of my weaker points is community. I'm a runner. Why do I run? Because I run away from people, right? So that's, the, that's the goal. As fast as you can. I don't know how to get community together. I'm going to admit that. But together, I think we can find ways to interact more, to engage more, to be involved more, that we can see these verses played out. Let's go to verse 11. Gospel not only requires that we interact with each other, the work in community, but it also must be directed by the Lord himself. Look at verse 11. He says, now may our God and Father himself and of our Lord Jesus Christ direct your way. Man, if you want a prayer for graduates, we have a few graduates. We're going to be celebrating graduation Sunday in the uh, early part of June because we have some college people coming back. But if this is a prayer, you want to pray for someone or your kids, underline this verse. Now that the Lord, the Father himself and Lord Jesus direct our way to you. That is the prayer for everyone, that God would direct them, that God would lead them. But our direction requires His Lordship. Everything we do in this community goes back to who He is, what He has done, what He's going to do. He says, now may our God and Father, this is the first person of the Trinity, and then He goes to the Lord Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He doesn't mention the Spirit, but it's there. But friends, our direction is by His plan and not ours. Every pastor and Lane taught last night on this, and he's 22, growing, he's going to be 23 soon. Lane, we're so happy you've, you've aged so much. I, love, I tease him all the time. But friends, we are part of a kingdom where people will always want to do their own thing. 
And church, we are asking for your prayers in these coming days that as we lead, as we grow together, as we get back together, that we would pray this, God, direct us, direct our way back to you. For some outside, that's going to be coming back inside. For some online, it's going to be coming back inside. For some inside, it's going to be reconnecting in the community together. But friends, we are part of a kingdom that will demolish all pretenders and will fulfill in a furious fashion the promise that's already sealed because he has done it for us. God has already won the victory. I mean, isn't it weird? You don't have to be cool or big or strong or technological, technologically savvy or politically fashionable or culturally relevant. To be part of this community, you have to do one thing, don't you? You have to turn from your sin, repent, and trust the Lord Jesus who died, who took the punishment, who's buried, and who rose again. And it's sinners that he wants it's the losers like us that he chose, sorry, but he chose us. And through the weird, messy church that we call Tower View Baptist Church in a pandemic or not, it is God's plan A for the world to use this community to reach this area, to reach your neighborhood, to reach your workplace, to reach your family right here, right now. That's it. God, you lead us. God, you direct us. So many churches today are more about the personality than they are the leading of the Lord. Friends, I pray. I pray you've seen after six years here, I don't have much personality. Nelson doesn't have much personality. Craig's another story. <laughs> but he's got five weeks left, and then, well, you know, it's a sad thing. But we're not led by personality here. We are led by this prayer. Lord, if we're going to lead a gospel community that's suffering together, we must be directed by yourself. Look at verse 12. Let's go on the last two. Verse 12. Not only must we be led by him, but we must also do what verse 12 says, that we can only be successful through the power of Christ. Not only must he lead us, but we must be successful. He says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Notice what he says there. The Lord is the success key. It's not our strategies. It's not our programs. It's not our planning. That can all be done. We need to do that, but we submit it to the Lord because only he can give the increase. Only he can do it, right? I mean, Look, if you want to plant something in the ground, you just don't put a seed in there and say, good luck, have fun, hope you grow. You water it. You, 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 I'm not a gardener. You do the gardener thing. I'm looking at some of my gardeners around here. You know, some of you all who do gardening well, you know how that works. You put fertilizer on it. I'll tell you a story. I don't, Willie Davis uh, at our last church uh, several years ago when Natalie and I first got married, he trusted me to keep his plants alive when he went on vacation. Well, I overwatered them to the fact they died of drowning, so uh, he never asked me to do that again. This is why we don't trust ourselves, right? Especially spiritually, we trust the Lord. May the Lord cause you to increase. Isn't that what John prayed in John 3? May he increase and I decrease. What's he praying to increase? Two things. He tells you what he wants to increase. He wants a real increase in a love for the church family. A love for one another. That's our prayer. A love for one another. God, grow a love in Tower View for each other. Deeper than it was. Wider than it was. More expansive than it ever has been. But there's also a love here, and I'm looking back at one of our missionary guys, and he does this every Tuesday faithfully with me. There's not only a love for each other, there's a real love for the lost. Did you notice that? Look at the end of verse 12. As we do our, our love for one another and for all. And for all. It's the same phrase used in Matthew 28 when Jesus said, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we pray for community, we're not only praying that, Lord, uh, so to speak, Lord, take the wheel. Guys, sometimes we pray, Jesus, just take the wheel. Well, we're back, we're in the back seat, passed out dead, because that's just who we are outside of his strength, right? He always directs the ship. Lord, increase our love for each other. But Lord, as we see our love increase for you together as Christians, may you increase our love for those without Christ. And that's the prayer. I know that my passion, one of my gifts is evangelism. It always has been. And I don't say that pridefully. That's just how God has done that. And I, I get weak and, and fearful and ask Aaron every Tuesday. I'll say, Aaron, hey, why don't you go ahead and knock on this? And like five doors later, I'll knock on a door kind of thing. But I want to encourage you that we keep evangelism in the forefront because it's needed, friends. 
Sometimes we pray so much to keep saints out of heaven that we don't pray to get lost people out of hell. Well, shouldn't we be praying for the saints? Absolutely we should. We're called to do that. We've already said that. But how much do we pray for lost people to come to know Jesus Christ? For you were called, Galatians 5, to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through the love serve one another. For the whole law is filled in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor starts with telling them about the greatest love we have is that Jesus came to die for us. How do we do this? It's not philosophical. Look at the last little phrase there. I think he puts some feet to this. He says, as we do for you. He says, don't just make this a concept of prayer. Don't just talk about this. Don't just say, man, I want to do that. Go do it. Get out there and do it. If you really want to see your community grow, guys, we have two babies in our church today, and that's so good to see. Two of our babies born recently. If the church ain't crying, it's dying is the old phrase. You've heard that before. But if the church isn't evangelizing, it's fossilizing as well. If we're not sharing the gospel together, inviting people in, saying, hey, this pandemic's been really hard. Come to church. Have you heard the gospel? How do we fill these pews? We fill them by people sharing the gospel and by praying for that. Last thing is this. The gospel, not only the work of the gospel is not only to bring people together, but again, it's to bring the lost sinners into holiness. This is what he says. Close with this. He says, so that we may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before the Lord God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. The gospel is a message of his mercy. Mercy is like when you have a car. I give Craig my car. That's a scary thought. I give Craig my car and Craig wrecks my car. You did not wreck it, but in this example, you did. So that's how it works. And I say to Craig, Craig says, brother, I'm sorry, I wrecked your car. It's totaled. And I say, Craig, that's okay. I forgive you. That's mercy. To take it even further, I give Craig our van. That's even scarier, especially for my wife. And Craig wrecks the van. And Craig comes back to me and says, pastor, I wrecked your van too. Do you forgive me? And I say, yes, I do. Here's another car. We call that grace. Guys, that's the message we have. We have been blamelessly put in God's sight. It's a merciful thing that we can even get to him. But he didn't stop there. He kept piling it on and piling it on and piling it on and piling it on. God has never given you more grace than he has in Jesus Christ, and he will never stop giving you grace until he calls you home or he returns. What is the purpose of it? Is that we would be holy before our God. So at the coming, whenever that is, we will be ready, and friends, he is coming again. Let me say that again. It's not just some symbol. It's not just some wives' tale. It didn't happen, as our JW friends would say back in 1918, in some invisible fashion. Jesus is going to come literally. He's going to come visibly. He's going to come gloriously. He's going to come powerfully. He's going to come sovereignly. He's going to come really, because that's what he said is going to happen. And at that day, we need to be ready Yes, as a Christian, you are covered by the blood of the Lamb, absolutely, totally, but you need to know that at the end of the day, you need to be ready as well, because you will stand and give account for how you handled these passages of Scripture. Friends, that's it. This is what it's about. The work of the gospel, and I'll go through these, I'll put them online, the work of the gospel is this, and I've got to get back to my notes. I have so many, I can't keep up with them. The work of the gospel must be spread abroad, not just in one place. It places you in harm's way. It's under constant bombardment from the enemy. It's going to bring encouragement to Christians who labor. It is the only thing that's worthwhile. It requires support and interaction of other believers. It must be directed by the Lord himself. It's successful through the power of Christ. And it brings us into holiness before our God. If you were to pray one chapter for our church, 1 Thessalonians 3 in God's timing would be just that. Take that to heart. Guys, we love you so much. Craig and I always talk before as we're making copies before service. Guys, the, the, the future of our church is very bright. I hope you see that. Oh, what about this? What about, we have a lot of things to take care of, especially this carpet from 1983. Praise God. We have a lot of structural things to take care of. We have a lot of organizational things to take care of. We have a lot of things to celebrate, to take care of. But I want to tell you the future of Tower View is bright because the Lord is at the wheel. 
can we just follow behind him? It's really that simple, not really that profound. But one thing that's for sure with this church is God will grow it as much as we are faithful to him and each other in community. If we suffer together, okay, bring it on because our God's got our back. Amen. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. And I'll invite Pastor Craig and crew up to lead us out. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come, to be a part of this church. Father, Tower View's days, as all churches, have gone like a roller coaster up and down. Father, there's been high points, there's been low points, there's been just routine points. But Father, in the midst of it all, this community will grow as much as we trust you to bring the growth. Father, that's not some hyper-Calvinistic view of, uh, of, of sit on the hill and wait for the fireworks to rain down. Father, that's not the opposite side of that extreme where if we don't get so busy with the work of the Lord, then God can never do anything because we've got to do 90% and He does 10 Father, somewhere in the midst of those two, we balance out the truth that we need each other in this church. We need each other and that love to increase. We need to understand our, that suffering is real. You told us beforehand. We need to know, Lord, that, that, that you are the one who provides a direction and strength. And we need to know that, Lord, there are people without Christ all around us, including our family, our neighbors, our, our coworkers, virtual as they may be in these days. This neighborhood needs to be reached for Jesus. There's very few gospel-preaching churches within a five-mile radius in Gracemore, Maple Park, and Clay Como. But yet, Father, together we, we know the future is bright because you said you're coming again and that you will not let the gates of hell prevail against your church universal. And I would assume, Lord, until you call a church home, until the gates of hell will not prevail against the local church either. This is your plan A. So, Father, in the days ahead, increase our love for each other. Increase our love for the lost. Give us wisdom in how to plan and implement things going forward that both are safe and sensible, but also re realistic in the way we handle ourselves in this pandemic. Father, increase our desire for your word, for evangelism, for prayer, for thankfulness, even for your presence, that we would see it lived out. Father, this church at Thessalonica was near and dear to Paul, and he longed to see them. But I pray also from the scripture that we would see each other standing fast in the Lord. We may be weak at times, Lord, and, and the greatest strength we have is all that you can provide. It always is. But Lord, let this church know each other well enough that we're able to comfort, we're able to call out, we're able to be there to also come alongside if necessary, whatever life brings, together in community. Father, we pray these things as they are directed from your scripture in 1 Thessalonians 3. We love you so much. We ask this today in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen.